Okay, so let's uh, start our second defense for today. Again, thanks for staying with us. So let me very, very briefly introduce because nothing has changed in the committee and the only thing that has changed is the candidate. So the, we have Andrei Kardashian, supervisor is Professor Jacob Bimonte. The title is On Application of Variational, Variational Quantum Circuits. So like 30 seconds jury and the candidate and a little bit more for the candidate uh, presentation. So, so Ivan Asiledis, it's me. Next slide. Yeah, Evgeny Kiktenko is also here. Next slide. Again, nothing has changed. Please refer to the previous video. Pro Professor Tim, actually, how, how do you pronounce your last name? I said Burns, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, it's, it's Burns, it's correct. It's Burns. Okay. English is so such a difficult language sometimes to, 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 to read. Okay. Professor Tim Burns, Shanghai. Next. Next slide. Professor Vladimir Palulin here. Next. Dr. Zoltan Jimboros. Next slide. Yeah. No, we have Jacob Bimonte as a supervisor. And next slide. And well, the PhD candidate, Andrei Kardashian, PhD student Skoltyak. He obtained his master uh, in, actually in applied mathematics and informatics in the high school of economics. Well, in well, high school of economics. He is now a junior research scientist at Deep Quantum Laboratory, not Quantum Information Processing is written here, because that's, I know, as a director, I know the official name of the laboratory. Uh, his research interests is variational quantum computing, quantum machine learning. He is very brief in his self-presentation, but I'm pretty sure he will be very explicit and open in the presentation of his thesis. So 40 minutes, that's your time, please, Andrei. Shall we start? Please start. Um, dear jury members, dear everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Andrei Kardashian, and in this presentation, this presentation is dedicated to the defense of my thesis titled On Applications of Variational Quantum Circuits. Uh, variational quantum circuits is a core concept, is a core concept concept for the so-called uh, variational quantum algorithms. The algorithms which are uh, devised for uh, near-term noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. Um, in this thesis defense, we will consider three applications of variational quantum circuits. The first application is finding uh, the ground state energy of a given Hamiltonian. The second is uh, solving the problem of quantum channel discrimination. And the third is uh, the problem of classification of labeled quantum states. So in this thesis defense, I defend the following statements. First, given a Hamiltonian with the so-called zelashinsky mori interactions, one can use a variational quantum circuit to find an approximation for its ground state energy, such that this approximation is uh, less than the energy of the first excited state. Second, uh, variational quantum circuits can be used to achieve known upper bounds of the performance uh, of quantum channel discrimination. This is accomplished by replacing the optimization over input states and measurement operators by the optimization over real numbers, which parameterize a variational circuit. And third, given uh, a labeled data set generated by applying one of the two channels on arbitrary quantum states. And uh, if the labels indicates, indicate the channel which was applied, then we can use, uh, we can train a variational quantum circuit such that it allows to uh, discriminate quantum states uh, acted by one of the two channels. Um, to consider these statements in more detail, we should first introduce some definitions and concepts. First, quantum states. Uh, 
the state of a quantum system is described by a density operator, which acts in some Hilbert space. Commonly, our Hilbert space is a complex d-dimensional vector space. So a density operator is an operator such that it is Hermitian, it has only non-negative eigenvalues, and its trace is equal to one. If a density operator is a projector, then the corresponding state is called pure. In the bracket notation, such a state can be written as here. In quantum, in quantum computing, we commonly work with quantum bits or qubits. A quantum bit is a quantum system which is described by a density operator which acts in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. For n qubits, the number of dimensions would be 2 to the power of n. In the Hilbert space of n qubits, we can fix the so-called computational basis, which is uh, the, vectors, the vectors of which are indexed by combinations of zeros and ones. With respect to quantum states, we can measure observables. Generally, an observable is represented by a positive operator valued measure, or POVM. A POVM is a collection of Hermitian operators such that they are non-negative and they sum to the identity. Each of these operators corresponds to one of the measurement outcomes we can obtain. The probability of obtaining uh, a particular outcome after measuring the observable pi with respect to the state row is given by the trace of the product of the density operator and the measurement operator, which corresponds to the, to the up outcome which was obtained. If our observable consists of orthogonal projectors, then, then it is called projective valued measure. Additionally, if our measurement outcomes are real numbers, then such an observable can be represented as a Hermitian operator, which has uh, the measurement outcomes and measurement operators as its eigenvalues and the eigenprojectors. We also know that any Hermitian operator in the space of n qubits can be represented as a linear combination of tensor products of the identity operator and the Pauli operators, defined as shown on the slide. Now let us consider how quantum states are transformed. Uh, a general transformation of a quantum state is called a quantum channel. A quantum channel is a map such that it is linear, it preserves the trace, and it is completely positive. Any quantum channel admits the so-called Krauss representation uh, given by this expression. Here, the operators V are such that the, the sum of V Hermitian conjugate V gives the identity. In the particular case, when the input and output spaces are the same, and when there is only one operator in the sum, then the corresponding transformation is unitary. Another useful representation is the Steinspring representation. In this representation, the action of a channel phi on a state row is described as a unitary transformation of the joint state rho tau, where the state tau is taken from some auxiliary space and then tracing out this auxiliary space. We can, a, a unitary operator can be parameterized by a, by a set of real numbers. If we can tune these parameters, we call such an operator a variational quantum circuit. Uh, such circuits is a crucial part of variational quantum algorithms. Variational quantum algorithms are based on the concept of, uh, of the cost function. Generally, a cost function is a real valued function of uh, some observables, of expected values of some observables, measured with respect to some state, some states acted by a variational circuit. Uh, a cost function is devised such that if a set of circuit parameters delivers an optimum to this function, then these parameters also encode a solution to some problem of interest. As an example, let us consider the variational quantum eigensolver algorithm, or VQE, one of the most prominent variational algorithms. If we are given a Hamiltonian and our task is to find its ground state energy, 
Then we can minimize the expected value of this Hamiltonian with respect to some pure state acted by a variational circuit. The optimal circuit parameters, which minimize the expected value, allow us to also con construct the ground state vector. So we considered uh, all definitions and concepts we need, and let us consider the first application of variational circuits, variational quantum eigensolver. Consider the Hamiltonian shown on this slide. This Hamiltonian describes a chain of n spins. Here, the first term is, uh, describes the so-called Heisenberg inter interaction, which favors collinear ordering of spins. The second term describes the so-called zelashinsky mori interaction, which uh, tends to rotate the neighboring spins. And the last term stands for the transverse magnetic field. Let us divide our Hamiltonian by J. In the continuous limit for this Hamiltonian, one can find an analytical solution for the spin configuration in the ground state. And for example, if we put these parameters for the coefficient, for these values for the coefficients d and b, the spin configuration will be as shown in the picture on this picture. So as we see, every spin is a little bit rotated with respect to its neighbors. So in our work, we applied, we numerically applied the variational quantum eigensolver algorithm for this Hamiltonian for 10 qubits. That is, we used a variational circuit to parameterize a pure state and minimize the expected value of this Hamiltonian. To represent our variational circuit, we used the so-called hardware-efficient ansatz, which may consist of several layers. Um, this one layer of the ansatz has uh, an array of single qubit rotations, which are represented by uh, Pauli rotations, and a block which is able to introduce the entanglement to the system. In our case, this block was implemented as controlled Y rotations, as a chain of controlled rotations. Uh, on this slide, we, uh, we present the results of our numerical experiments. On the upper panel, we show the energy found by VQE versus the number of layers of the hardware efficient ansatz. On the bottom panel, we show the overlap of the VQE solution with the exact, exact ground state. So as we see with already four layers of the ansatz, we obtain uh, the approximation of the ground state energy, which lies within the gap, the difference between the smallest and the second smallest eigenvalues, which, is, which are indicated by the green lines. At the same time, the precision of our state vector in terms of the overlap is not very high. This lack of precision we attribute to the entanglement properties of our ground state. Let us consider the so-called concurrence for all pairs of qubits. The concurrence is a measure devised to quantify the entanglement of arbitrary two qubit state. So if rho ij is the reduced density operator of the ith and jth qubits, then its concurrence is defined as shown here. Here, the coefficients lambda are the ordered eigenvalues of this operator. The asterisk here indicates the complex conjugation. On this slide, on the left panel, we show the concurrences for all pairs of qubits for the ground state found by VQE. For example, this square tells us that the concurrence between the second and the fourth qubit is approximately uh, 0.1. On the right plot, we show the concurrences for the VQE solution divided by the exact concurrences. And what we can observe is that the more distant are the qubits, the less their entanglement is reproduced. So this suggests that we need more layers to, to capture the long range entanglement. Let us draw the conclusions. First, uh, we can use variational quantum circuits uh, 
so with six layers of the hardware efficient ansatz, we found an approximation of our Hamiltonian, which lies within the gap, the interval between the smallest and the second smallest eigenvalues. And also we observed that uh, with six layers of, of our ansatz, we could not reproduce uh, long range entanglement. So we have considered the first application of variational circuits, finding the ground state energy. Uh, let us consider another problem, problem which can be showed solved variationally, the problem of quantum channel discrimination. The problem of quantum channel discrimination is the problem of distinguishing between two channels, phi zero and phi one. Uh, what we do is uh, first preparing an input state row and sending it to a channel. As an output, we receive uh, our state acted by one of the two channels, phi zero or phi one, chosen randomly. And finally, we measure the output state with a POVM of two operators, phi zero and phi one. The probability of obtaining the measurement outcome, which coincides with the label of the channel, is given by this expression. The trace of the product of the output state and the measurement operator, which corresponds to the outcome. So our goal is to find the input state row and a pair of measurement operators pi, such that they maximize the probability of obtaining the outcome zero if the channel which was, act, uh, which was applied to our input state was phi zero and the probability of obtaining the outcome one if the channel was phi one. This expression gives the total probability of successful discrimination between the channels phi zero and phi one. This probability is known to be upper bounded by this quantity, where we have the distance between the channels induced by the so-called diamond norm. The diamond norm of a, of a channel phi is the maximum trace norm of a density operator acted by a map composed of the channel phi itself and the identity map. The maximization here is performed over the density operators. So the problem of quantum channel discrimination is a problem of optimization over input states and measurement operators. Now let us show that we can solve it with variational circuits. First, let us assume that we work with n qubit channels. To prepare an input state for such a channel, we act with a variational circuit on a pure state of this form, where we have n input qubits and r auxiliary qubits. Then this input state is sent to a channel and the output state is given by this expression, where y is the label of the channel. Now we need to measure the output state with a POVM pi. In quantum computing, it is commonly assumed that we can measure only, observ only observables of this form, which is a collection of the projectors onto the computational basis. Uh, what we can do here is applying another variational circuit and effectively it transforms the measurement operators. Let us consider the state before the measurement. Recall that the input state is prepared by acting with a variational circuit on an input state which has R auxiliary qubits. These qubits may serve two purposes. First, they allow us to prepare an arbitrary input state in the Steinspring representation. Second, it allows us to, it allows us to, has, to, have, to have entanglement between the input qubits and the auxiliary qubits, which is known to generally improve the discrimination efficiency. So we can rewrite the problem of quantum ch channel discrimination in this form. Here now, instead of maximization over the input states and measurements, we maximize over the real numbers, which parameterize our variational circuits. The operators pi zero and pi one can be chosen such that the first operator is the sum of the projectors of the, of the half, first half of the projectors onto the computational basis. And the second operator is the sum of the second half of these projectors. 
Now let us consider the so-called Pauli channel. This is a single qubit channel which depends on the on the parameter alpha, taking values from zero to one. With the coefficient one minus alpha, the state remains unchanged. And with the coefficient alpha over three, the state is conjugated by Pauli, by Pauli operators. In our work, we tested our, uh, this variational approach in discriminating two Pauli channels with different coefficients, alpha zero and alpha one. Uh, in our numerical experiments, we modeled the discrimination process by this quantum circuit. Looking ahead, we needed two auxiliary qubits to, um, to achieve the highest discrimination efficiency. And as before, our variational circuits were represented by, the, by several layers of the hardware-efficient ansatz. This time, however, the, entangle, the entangling block was represented by a chain of the controlled knot operators defined here. On this slide, we present the results of our numerical experiments in discriminating two Pauli channels with the coefficients zero and alpha one using one and two layers of the hardware efficient ansatz. For example, this square tells us that if we discriminate between the Pauli channels with the coefficients 0 0.2 and 0 0.9, then we obtain the, um, the success probability to be approximately 0 0.8. Um, two observations can be made here. First, um, the more distant are the coefficients alpha, the better are the discrimination results. And second, uh, with two layers of the ansatz, we achieve better discrimination efficiency. Uh, let us recall that in this setting, the, the probability of successful channel discrimination is given by this expression, where we have the distance between two channels induced by the diamond norm. If we divide our results uh, by this quantity, we see that with two layers of the of the ansatz, sorry, we achieve this upper bound. Um, so far, we have considered a simple situation when uh, we can apply the channel only once. In literature, however, considered also are more um, the situations when the channel can be probed several times. This gives rise to the two discrimination strategies, the parallel and the sequential. In the parallel strategy, if we are allowed, if we are allowed to probe the channels p times, then we um, apply the channel simultaneously to the subsystems of the input state. In the sequential strategy, after each channel application, we are allowed to modify the, the output state and send it back for the next channel application. Uh, let us discuss the upper bounds for these two strategies. For the parallel strategy, the, the upper bound of the prob probability of successful discrimination is given by this expression, which is essentially a simple modification for the single use channel discrimination, where P, the number of channel applications, is equal to one. At the same time, for the sequential strategy, no such bound is known for arbitrary channels, phi zero and phi one. Let us again consider the Pauli channel. Uh, in our work, we tested uh, the variational discrimination approach uh, in uh, distinguishing between two channels with different coefficients, with the parallel and the sequential strategy, with two allowed channel applications. As we mentioned earlier, for the sequential strategy, we generally do not know the upper bound of the success probability. But for Pauli channels, it is shown to be the same as for the, for the parallel strategy, which is given by this expression. The discrimination process for both strategy was modeled by these two quantum circuits. Looking ahead again, we found that uh, to, to achieve the highest discrimination efficiency for the sequential strategy, we needed four auxiliary qubits. 
And for the parallel strategy, we introduced three qubits to make the total number of qubits for both strategies to be five. And as before, our variational circuits were represented by the hardware efficient ansatz of several layers. On this slide, we present the results of our numerical experiments in discriminating uh, Pauli channels with uh, different coefficients using the parallel and the sequential strategies. On these plots, on these plots, uh, the, the horizontal axis shows the pairs of the coefficients for the channels between which we try to discriminate. The vertical axis shows the success probability which was, uh, which was achieved. And the color of the curves indicates the number of layers we used to parameterize the ansatz. Also, we have here the solid black line, which shows the, uh, the upper bound of the success probability. Two observations can be made here. First, we see that the sequential strategy generally performs better than the parallel. Uh, as we can see, with 14 layers of the ansatz, the sequential strategy achieves the upper bound, which is given by the, um, by the diamond distance between the channels, and which is not achieved for the parallel strategy. Another observation is that um, one, one may notice that the upper bound, which is given by the the black line is symmetric, uh, meaning that if we want to discre uh, that uh, the diamond distance between the Pauli channels with the coefficients, for example, 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, is the same as the diamond distance between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. Sorry. But at the same time, we see that generally uh, the results on the left are better than the results on the right. This is especially uh, noticeable for the sequential strategy if we look at the green curve. In our work, we did not explain this effect and this is a direction, a possible direction for future research. So our conclusion is the following. Given a black box access to a pair of quantum channels, the variational approach allows to achieve known upper bounds on the probability of successful discrimination. So uh, we saw that uh, in the problem of quantum channel discrimination, we can replace the optimization over states and measurements by optimization over the circuit parameters. Also, we observed that for uh, Pauli channels, we, with this approach, we can achieve known upper bounds on the success probability. And also, we needed almost no prior knowledge to apply this, this approach. The only, the only information we needed is uh, the sizes of the input and output qubits. So how many qubits we send and how many qubits we receive from a channel. So we considered the problem of uh, quantum channel discrimination, where we need to find the input state and measurement operators. Now let us consider a similar problem, which we call quantum channel classification. So the difference with the quantum channel discrimination problem is that uh, this time we do not control the input states. Uh, instead, now we are given a collection of output states and the labels of the channels. Uh, the peculiarity here is that uh, each output state is produced from an arbitrary input state, which are unknown to us. So our goal is to use this given collection, which we call a training set, to learn how to distinguish between the channels phi zero and phi one. We solve this problem as follows. Uh, for every output state from this training set, we apply a variational circuit, which gives, uh, which gives the state of this form. Then we measure an observable H, which has the eigenvalues zero and one. Uh, this expectation value serves as a prediction for the labels of the channels. 
So our task is to use this uh, given collection to train the circuit such that uh, this expected value gives the right predictions for the channel labels. The optimal circuit parameters can be found uh, as the ones which, uh, which minimize uh, the square differences between the true labels and our predictions. And essentially this expression can be considered as a cost function for a variation quantum, uh, for variation quantum algorithm. So in what follows, we tested this approach in classifying the output states of, uh, of the Pauli channels with, uh, of Pauli channels with different coefficients, alpha zero and alpha one. To train the variational circuit, we generated a, a training set consisting of 1000 entries. And to test the circuit, we used um, a test, um, a set of the same size, 1000 data points. Um, on this slide, on the left plot, we show the accuracy achieved uh, for um, the accuracy of classif classification between the output states acted by uh, Pauli channels with the coefficients alpha zero and alpha one. What we can see here is that uh, the maximum the maximum accuracy is achieved for uh, the parameter alpha being 0.75 which is indicated by the red lines here. On the right plot, we show the picture when one of the parameters, alpha one, is fixed to zero, and the other parameter is varied. So essentially, we consider the very bottom line of this plot on the left. As we can see, the curves, which represent the accuracy, the classification accuracy, are not smooth, and the maximum is attained at the point zero point seventy five the the red line um, this point is special for this Pauli channel as um, for this value of the for this value of the coefficient alpha the output state is always the so-called maximally mixed state regardless of the input so we can say that uh, the classifier this classifier works works best if it is trained to distinguish between the maximally mixed state and the other, and any other output state of this channel. So our conclusion is the following. A variational quantum circuit provided with a suitable cost function can be used for binary classification of unknown quantum channels. So we observe that we can use a variational circuit to, uh, to classify labeled quantum states, which get their labels from the action of a channel. And again, to apply it, we needed almost no prior knowledge about the channel. The, the only information we need is the size of, uh, of the output state given, given in the training set. So in this, in this presentation, we considered three applications of variational circuits. The first was uh, the variational quantum eigensolver algorithm which finds the, which approximates the ground state energy of a given Hamiltonian. Second, we solved the problem of quantum channel discrimination and we used variational circuits to classify labeled quantum states. Uh, overall, my thesis um, consists, contains the results and ideas from the papers listed on the slide. And in one way or another, they are, connect, they are related to variational quantum circuits or quantum computing in general. With this, I would like to conclude my presentation and thank everyone for the attention. Okay, thank you, Andre, for the presentation of your results. So let's uh, uh, start the questions from the jury. Let's select another order that is different from the first one. So I would ask Vladimir Palulin to ask the first, some of, some of the questions. Thank you for your presentation. So um, I've listed some of the questions <laughs> in the report, but during the talk, I also uh, yeah, a couple of other questions appeared to me. So in the first part, you talk about the Lashinsky Mori interactions, and you set uh, two parameters for certain values. These 
ratios of interaction constants, basically. Uh, yeah, so the, the field to the coupling constant and D over J. So why did you choose these specific numbers? Is the result sensitive to these numbers in any way? The, sorry. Uh, yes, so the, these uh, particular assignments were, um, so the reasoning is the following. Uh, as I said, for this Hamiltonian, it is possible with some approximations and, uh, and assumptions, it is possible to find the spin configuration for this Hamiltonian. And uh, these values for the coefficients were chosen such that uh, if we take uh, two uh, 10 qubits, we can, uh, we can observe, let's say, the full, the full period of this, uh, of this rotation, let's say. And uh, about about the influence on the results, uh, yes, as I remember, the higher is this um, this Zelashinsky Moria coefficient, the the higher is the entanglement between the neighborhood and spins. So yes. Okay, but I guess you could guess uh, you could get the same period with other pairs of numbers, right? Uh, so will it affect the performance in some way? Well, it should. Uh, you mean uh, it? We could find assignments for different numbers of qubits, or uh, not, not for different. So you still have, let's say, ten qubits, uh, but then you find another pair of constants which still produce this full period of of the spiral, or it's a half a period. Uh, I guess that this, I think, it's possible, but uh, for, I can say. Okay, uh, because yeah, the question is about generality, whether the results you show are kind of general enough or not, or this kind of a particular case. Um, nevertheless, I mean, it shows the principle, so uh, thank you. So the second question which appeared to me now, like you show that sequential strategy is better than the parallel strategy in channel discrimination. Uh, which is a nice result. Uh, what you don't mention, and it appeared to me now, that probably there is some time penalty for that. Because if you do the realization this in a real system, like in a parallel strategy, you kind of do it in one go. Well, it seems that in sequential go uh, case, you have to do sequential operations, which take, let's say, twice longer. Uh, am I correct? Uh, I think yes. Well, we did not measure the time to solution, for example, but if we look at the circuits, so probably yes, because for the sequential strategy, we have three, three variational circuits, meaning that we have uh, more parameters to optimize. Yeah, so it kind of works better, but you basically you need more parameters. So I'm also asking this question that uh, it's a toy model, it's a simple system. So if you apply the same strategy to, let's say, discrimination of more channels or to a more complex problem, then uh, it seems that there could be some trade-off. So it doesn't mean that sometimes maybe parallel strategy doesn't discriminate that well, but it just works faster. Uh, okay. Yes, I think so. Can you repeat, please? Uh, so basically, do you think that there could be cases when the parallel strategy will be more efficient if we have time constraints, let's say? Because time is also, it's a different kind of efficiency, let's say, which for, sometimes has to be optimized as well. For time constraints, maybe, yes, because, but uh, at the same time, we, we do not achieve the, uh, the results we can achieve. So if we are satisfied with, uh, with some underperformance, let's say, then yes, yes, this should work, this should work faster. Uh, okay, so then uh, there were a couple of questions uh, in my report. So in, yeah, in the same chapter, I think the, the next, like the, in the channel classification, you have a sample size of 1,000 samples, if I remember correctly. So did you estimate the performance uh, dependence on the size of the sample? Uh, yes, I did. And let me maybe switch to one of the slides in the appendix. 
Uh, yes, uh, what I try to do is to um, to success, successfully increase the size of the training set. So on the left, we have uh, the uh, training accuracy uh, versus the size of the training set. So, um, so for example, as we see that if we have few entries in the training set, then uh, the classifier works, uh, which is expected quite good, but uh, at the same time, for um, some assignments uh, of the parameters alpha, for example, if we fix alpha 0 to 0 and alpha 1 to 0 0.75, which gives the best uh, accuracy, then um, the accuracy we obtain doesn't change much after 210 trees. But uh, increasing the set size, uh, the size of the training set is, uh, so it, uh, it increases the uh, efficiency for uh, for the assignments uh, alpha zero to zero and alpha one to zero point one, which are quite close to each other. Then yes, it depends. It depends on the on the distance between the alphas, the coefficients of the power channel. Okay, thank you. Yeah, looks very nice that you uh, prepared the pictures. Um, so I also had a question about chapter three, but you yeah, kind of didn't talk about it in the presentation because I think yeah, this particular one wasn't published. Uh, how universal this reduction of the representation is, if you remember my question. I think it's uh, not universal, but uh, for the algorithms I, I reviewed in the third chapter, it's possible. But uh, I, give, I gave an example in the end of this chapter for, uh, for a variational algorithm for which I couldn't find uh, a reduction to VQE, yes. Okay, so thank I you. Think gen generally, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah, I think the other remarks you kind of included, at least what I checked in the text. So I transfer the micro to, to the next member of the committee. So the, the, the next member will be Vikini. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, th thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, uh, so uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is about the state discrimination. Uh, so as far, so from kind of general information theoretic point of view, it seems that uh, the problem of uh, distinguishing between two channels can be somehow reduced to, to the problem of distinguishing states. Uh, and so uh, as far as I understand, so you, you added into, into your thesis uh, that, okay, we can, we can uh, consider this, uh, the results of action of these channels on maximally integral states, uh, which are what, what cho choice states, so we can compare the this, uh, this, 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 this states. And I wonder, uh, did you study uh, the results of your variational, variational algorithm? So what, what does it actually do? So d does it invent uh, does it invent uh, this creation of maximal entangled states in order to, to distinguish channel or it somehow use another strategy? And uh, my second question is, uh, somehow it relates to the pre previous talk. So uh, did you, did you uh, view in, in the results of your of, of operation of, your, of these algorithms, did you, uh, did you view something similar to this concentration of parameters uh, for for the obtained uh, obtained configurations of your circuits. So the, does it does this concentration concentration feature also appears in these kinds of problems? Well, regarding the last question, uh, the answer is no because no, I didn't check the, anything related to the parameters of the circuit. I, uh, what we did is just we obtain a result and yeah, maybe yeah, actually that's interesting. And uh, the first question was about, yes, so maybe let us consider one of the slides <laughs> in the appendix. So, um, yes, uh, in the thesis I added uh, a section in which I write that, uh, so you're right about the state discrimination that, um, okay, so <laughs> for quantum channels there is uh, a property known as uh, the so-called teleportation covariance, which is, uh, which has some complicated uh, relation to quantum teleportation. But uh, if a channel, if a channel 
is uh, holds this property of the teleportation covariant, then uh, for this channel, the optimal the optimal state for discrimination is uh, a Bell state. Uh, on this slide, there is an example of of two channels for which this property doesn't hold. This is these are called um, entanglement breaking channels. And uh, so essentially what they do, they map two qubit states into one qubit state. So, and uh, by Harrow and others, it was shown that uh, the parallel strategy, if we use the parallel strategy to discriminate these two channels, we never achieve the, the unity of, uh, of the success probability, regardless, uh, regardless the number of applications. But uh, by the same authors, it was shown that it is enough to apply these channels uh, only two times in uh, sequentially, which, um, and it allows to discriminate the channels perfectly. So uh, it's not written on the slide, but uh, for the sequential strategy, the optimal state, if we can use this notion for the sequential strategy, is just uh, the zero state tensored with an arbitrary qubit state. And in our numerical experiments, we, um, Yes, we modeled the discrimination by these circuits, and yes, we achieved um, we achieved this. Uh, so yes, it seems that uh, variational circuits finds this um, this strategy was which was engineered for this this pair this particular pair of channels. Nice, thank you very much. Okay, then I would like to ask Doctor. Zoltan Jimbunas to give his comments. Yes, thanks a lot for the presentation. And also, I think this was also a very nice thesis. Uh, one thing that I was a little bit, um, there was one thing I didn't completely like, and maybe I want to ask that question here, but otherwise it was a really good thesis, was that <clears throat> when you consider the Heisenberg chain with the jalozhinsky moiria interaction, and you are talking about the, like the, how the entanglement structure, uh, which is created by this interesting magnetism feature, uh, like, like exactly this, how it is reflected in the concurrences. I would say it's a nice picture, right? I, I, I don't have anything against this, but in many body physics, often important entanglement aspects are not related to the side-side entanglement, but rather, let's say, entanglement between blocks or the entanglement between a block and the rest of the spin chain. You know, there are these interesting results from conformal field theory and from other reasons how entangled the uh, block is with the rest of the chain even uh, in in dmrg and the uh, tensor network methods often th that is the limiting factor let's say how entangled like the block is whether the entanglement grows um, arbitrarily large let's say in logarithmic fashion typically in a conformal model or it saturates in a 1D chain. So my first question is, did you, I mean, I understand it's a nice plot and it reflects a lot of this structure, but didn't you consider also entanglement measures between blocks or a block and the rest of the chain? So for example, I take a subset of qubits and... Uh, and yes, and calculate the von Neumann entropy, which is the entanglement entropy with respect to the rest of the system. Uh, yes, but no, I did not consider this, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. But really, so what you showed makes perfect sense and so on, but often, often, um, this is not that great. Let me tell you one example. For example, if you take translation invariant critical models, most often, the side-side entanglement, whether they are critical or not, between nearest neighbor is entangled, maybe next nearest neighbor, and it's zero. And it doesn't uh, cover the fact that in the case of blocks, if it's non-critical, then it saturates the entanglement entropy, while for the critical one, it 
those logarithmic units. But okay, that was just a question. I really uh, enjoyed it, and also I like this very much. This work with the um, Jaroszynski Moria interaction. I also have one other question here. So, how would you think your methods would perform if you would uh, if you would uh, <clears throat> increase the dimension? So, let's say you would look at two dimensional cases. Would it be like terribly or or would you think it would be still perhaps good? Because that would be really interesting. I mean, it's already very interesting. Well, I would expect that the performance will be not that, <laughs> that high, but uh, I, I do not know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, one could perhaps try a five by five. It's 25 uh, qubits. It could be an interesting... Uh, Test. But thanks a lot. I really enjoyed this, and in particular in this work, I, I really like. Thanks. That that was all, all, all my questions. Thank you. Zoltan. So for the comments, um, yeah. Now next, I would like to ask Professor Tim Burns to give his comments and remarks about the presentation and the thesis. Okay, so yeah, first, uh, yeah, great talk, um, really clear, and uh, I really liked your presentation. Um, so actually, so Zoltan kind of uh, stole my question a bit. <laughs> um, I had a little bit of a similar kind of angle, so maybe I can... We well, both worked on Challenge with Maria, by the way, didn't we? No. Uh, yeah. We <laughs> right. other, yeah. Yep, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, my... my uh, version of the maybe kind of same question was that um, I mean this is a 1D model right and so in a 1D model these methods like DMIG and MPS uh, should work pretty well um, so you know I mean if you changed your basically variational ansatz to kind of follow that kind of ansatz I mean do you expect it would work better because um, I think you yourself said that, you know, maybe the results were, you know, not not maybe as good as uh, you hoped. I mean, I, I think your channel discrimination stuff looks, you know, like it's basically perfect, but then the spin model stuff, uh, you know, maybe there could be some room for improvement. Um, but what do you think about that? Uh, so the question is, uh, could you repeat please the question? So the question is, um, if you changed your variational ansatz state, right, to be more like an NPS type of state, then, you know, maybe the results, do you think the results will be improved? Well, I think, uh, I think yes, but uh, I don't know much about NPS, but um, as I know, it's the, okay, the, matrix product state is pretty efficient for gapped for gapped models which has you can do it for non-gapped because the, basically since this is one dimensional system i think i don't see any reason well it depends on the entanglement actually on the ground state if probably again since you have well, it's not gapped, right? So there is no gap between but if there is a gap between the smallest eigenvalue and the next one then there should be area law and there should be good entanglement yes, yes, and there yes, should yes. be good approximation. Yeah, this could be tried. It would be interesting to compare for sure. Just, well, sorry for it. Yeah, so, <laughs> yes, I think matrix product states or tensor network states here yeah, perform good here. Mm. Okay, I see. Um, okay, and then maybe just my second question is... Um, so with your channel classification, I mean, you know, you basically use a kind of a quantum method, but I mean, basically the approach looks very much like machine learning. Um, and so, you know, could you just do like more more kind of classical kind of strategy to do the classification where you just take some observables and uh, perform the classification based on that? Or do you think that would not perform as well? 
Well, uh, so <laughs> initially this work was motivated by by another work of my friend. So they uh, considered a similar problem, quantum channel classification, let's say, but uh, they used a classical neural network. So what they did, they um, they collected, uh, let's say, they collected the, so their training set was uh, essentially the same, but to represent it classically, what they needed to, uh, well, in reality, we, we would need full state tomography for this, to represent this, to represent, uh, so if our data points are represented by density operators, then we should first store them uh, before feeding into a, a classical network. So this is... Mm, well, yeah, I mean, but maybe you would just, you know, not do full tomography, but do some kind of uh, observables, but... Um, uh, so yes, in your... but uh, it should imply that we should we should find an optimal observable for this, right? Or, mm. I mean, well, this observable is not arbitrary, right? I mean, it should be it should be optimized mm -hmm. somehow, as I understand. Sure, sure, sure. Or sure, maybe yeah. if 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 we know the channel which we want the channels we, which we want to discriminate, maybe it's not necessary to f conduct the full tomography because, for example, if our channels do not um, do not change the for example, of diagonal elements, we don't need to to find them and to store. Right. Then, yeah, yes. I guess I'm uh, just asking broadly. You know, what's sort of the advantage of this more quantum approach? Well, for me, the advantage that every everything which is quantum is kept quantum here. Okay. I mean, the, right. the data point. Yeah. Okay then. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so actually, uh, Professor Burns asked uh, two of the questions, two of the questions that I wanted to ask about the simulation of the very well approximation by well MPS. Well, well, I would say tensor trains, but okay, this is more physics. So uh, yeah, so I th so I will just add a comment. Yeah, so this is the example of the work which actually good in the sense that you think immediately think how to improve it and this is actually a, a feature of a good work <laughs> in my opinion if you start I think well we, we can try to do better this may be not optimal and so on I think it's to me it's not because the, the work is not good but because but the problem is interesting yeah, indeed uh, probably for one dimensional spin chain with you can actually simulate it using different packages uh, up to hundreds, uh, thousands of spins with, and it would be interesting to look at what Zoltan said to like five times five two dimensional, where you cannot, uh, well, you can do like full simulation uh, with 25 qubits, but overall, um, and there is also this PEPS stuff um, for, for, to simulate this kind of thing, but not too many. It would be interesting to see whether the sort of expressive power of variational quantum circuits here is is valid. Is but then the second the second part again was about applying for classification some other machine learning models. Um, yeah, but I, I got the answer that uh, indeed the features are quantum states and you have to classify quantum states so you don't want to uh, project the quantum state on a certain set of observables uh, well you can do you can sort of find those sample from 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 the from the state of, from the channel and then try to classify the rem the sequences but overall yeah, it requires more or less a separate PhD so my question would be if you show the the list of slides the list of publications I would ask you a formal question so what's your personal contribution to those papers. The third paper is an experimental paper conducted in at MSU. So uh, this is a paper on on VQE again for the so-called Schwinger Hamiltonian, and the setup was. It's included in the thesis as well. Or you yes. Would... Okay. Yes. Yes. So my contribution is, uh, let's say, theoretical support and the idea to consider this Hamiltonian particularly, uh, because it was studied before us uh, in the framework of uh, variational computing, and there is some physical property which can be observed 
even for two qubits for this Hamiltonian. There, three. Um, the other, so the last one. So, in this in this presentation, I uh, I showed the results from the first two publications. So, the first one is uh, quantum channel discrimination. The second is uh, is uh, this uh, the wiki for zolashinsky moria interactions Hamiltonian, and the last one in the last paper we um, so. What's your personal contribution? Uh, so you have five authors. So what <laughs> you did and what they so did? Writing the paper and, uh, <laughs> and performing numerical experiments. Okay, and what yes. uh, everyone else did? <laughs> uh, well, it's, well, okay, it was, you did all I was, the work. I was greatly supported by the second author who, who knows classical machine learning. <laughs> okay, and what kind of classical machine learning you actually needed here? Uh, the, so, after we after we minimized this cost function, okay. we need to find the value which separates two classes. Okay. So, for example, uh, if my prediction value is less than or equal to some uh -huh. some value, then the class is zero. Uh -huh. It's okay. greater than one. Yeah, but that's optimization problem, right? So, so yes, but I didn't know about this. But the okay. second author did. <laughs> but what you use? You use like stochastic gradient stuff, or just gradient uh, optimization? Ah, uh, no. I mean, I mean, not for minimizing the uh -huh. the function itself. Okay. Once but... it is minimized, I need to. Um, I need to infer the labels from, okay. from the from the values of p j here. Uh -huh. Yes, and they need some some separation <coughs> classes. Okay, it, it was well. Typically, you draw like what is called aug rock curve for different splitting. But anyway, okay, yeah, so. and you but you report accuracy. You don't report. Yeah, I report accuracy. Not because also there is this F1 score, which is typically reported for. But okay, this is like balanced classification. You have uh, the same number of samples for each class, right? Yeah. Okay, no, then accuracy is okay. Okay, let's get it. So, okay, so second also, okay. The, the, the second paper? Second paper is uh, numerical experiments with. Uh with this Hamiltonian and the analytical solution was found by the last, by the second and the last authors. Okay. Yes. Okay. Clear. The third is, as I said. It's Jacob. Okay. It's okay. No, it's, it's absolutely normal that the advisor well, is on the, you don't, need to, yes. you don't need to explain. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and the, the fourth is... paper said you don't uh, talk about it today or? Uh, no, I didn't talk, but uh, so this is about the, so when we applied the VQE algorithm, we found, we find some solution and okay. uh, yeah, but generally we do not know how close it is to, to the, to being, uh, okay. yeah. And we, in this paper, we introduced two methods, which uh, allow to say that how close our found. What's the idea there? The idea is, so the first idea is, was known, uh, we can, uh, we can compute the variance of the energy, so the expected value of the Hamilton squared minus the squared expected of Hamiltonian of the Hamiltonian, and uh, this, which we called the var called the variance, is equal to zero. Uh, the, so if if this variance is equal to zero, then we at least found an eigenstate of this. Uh, the second method. Yeah, but there is no guarantee that this is yes. a ground state. Yes, that's true. That's true. So at least we can say that it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, if, if it's an eigenstate, you can check if you apply the, well, okay, that's clear. Yeah, and uh, the second method is constructing um, the uh, evolution, the unitary evolution of Hamilton. So essentially exponentiating it. And uh, the, so once we have this evolution mentioned of our Hamiltonian, then we uh, can compute the uh, squared squared uh, squ the, <laughs> the expected value absolute squared mm -hmm. and it is equal to one if and only mm -hmm. if uh, this state is an eigenstate of of a unitary operator which is the same as to be an okay. eigenstate for the hamiltonian okay for which yeah. yes. okay uh so again it's a certification that is close to eigenstate i see how close it 
Okay, I don't have any more questions. Um, so we are done with the questions from the jury. So thank you. So now we have questions from the general audience. Um, Ileana, can you help me with that? We don't have any questions. Yeah, yeah, then I will read. Uh, yeah, so. No question for, so now, now Jacob, well, I think Jacob, you have the mic now, you can say something. It, I think it's- Yeah, you hear you, so please. You, we hear you well, we heard at least. Jacob? No, no, it was, he was on and he was actually perfect. He's still, you are still on, but we don't hear you. Can you hear, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so there were actually two other papers, one of which was actually a first author paper, and they didn't really break the narrative of the thesis that much, but they somehow were not included in the presentation or the results of the thesis. Um, but the papers that were included, which primarily is the three papers there, with the experimental paper, some kind of validation of one of the ideas, these papers were very good. And it, <clears throat> you know, the thesis is about this variational, you know, applications of variational quantum circuits. Um, in terms of, you know, looking at this, uh, looking at this channel discrimination, I think these, you know, this was Andre's idea, and it was a good idea. This has attracted a lot of attention, and I think going forward, using you know a quantum computer to sort of probe properties of its own environment using ideas from machine learning is actually a pretty cool idea. And you know, this is the first paper on that. I was quite pleased when Andre came up with this idea. I was very skeptical. We we debated this really heavily for a long time, and you know, overall, I think Andre um, you know really dug into the analysis of everything he did. I think it was a very successful PhD. I think he's a very good speaker as well, which helps. And, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased, Andre. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with you. I, I think this is, you know, a good presentation. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. So we have finished the, this part. So now we move again to the closed discussion by the jury members. I kindly ask all the non-members of the jury to leave, except Elena without whom we will not be able to do our stuff. Okay, they're having coffee, no? Andre is here. So, Andre, so the jury, after a short discussion, have mentioned that uh, the work, the, your work is a very, of very high quality, the text, the presentation, and we congratulate it, and the decision is accept the thesis as it is, so let's congratulate on this very important achievement. Did you say something already? Uh, not yet. Ah, but... yes. ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Thank you. I think. Okay. So I. Will... <laughs> okay. I wish to thank uh, external jury members. Oh, Professor Burns, Professor Zimboras for agreeing to review my thesis and for finding the time to come at the defense despite the time difference between between Budapest and Shanghai. Also, I thank my <laughs> my internal jury members for essentially the same reasons. I thank Jacob Diamonte for, for being my supervisor, for his guidance and mentorship. I thank my... <laughs> family and friends and everyone who came here, who supported me and the, the guys from the lab. Thank you for 